Uh, I don't know whether. Oh, All right, there you go. We wouldn't be here. <laughs> yep, right. it's very interesting. There is a little thing that mm -hmm. tell me when it's being recorded. Right. All right. So, um, Joel Federman. So, uh, so everybody knows. Because they yeah, told we us that we have to, to do him. that. Yeah, we'll have yeah. more people. With me. Yeah. Hello, Joel Federman. How are you? Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? Not, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you all. So wh where are you? Joel, you are in San Francisco. Yes. San Francisco. What time is over there? It's 3 a.m. 7, Seven in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> That's commitment. That's academic commitment. <laughs> <laughs> what time is with you, Wendy? You are at 7 o'clock too? No, 9 o'clock. Oh, Almost okay. nine o'clock. Well, yes. uh, that's good. Yeah. It's that's a good. beautiful Which hour. Is, yeah, it's a difference. Yeah, it's a different time. Anyway. So, quick question. Um, yes, just sir. In terms of the format. Um, are we going to be representing part of our papers? Are we just going to be talking about things? How? How would you we... know? You know, it's, that's something that. All of us, the, all the presenters decide how you want. It's a very flexible. In the previous uh, session, it was an, an open conversation. We talk about the issues. Um, if you want to highlight maybe within five minutes or three minutes, they, to highlight the main points, because each of you make a lot of interesting points. So if you want to do that, that's another thing that we can do at the beginning and then establish the conversation. I don't know, I'll, I'll ask it, you know? This is tried and error. It's not a, we're trying to be as flexible as possible so we don't fall into the 20 minutes and then there's no much time to have a conversation at the end. That's the idea. Just waiting for a couple more colleagues. Let me see, they are not here. That's good, you are here, that means the link is working. The link is working. So, so Cynthia, the, the conversation about immigration is always, always, always something that it, it's open all the time, the different reactions, the different, how different countries respond to that, that process. Yes, you were talking about our previous session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While we wait for, from our colleagues. Yes, yeah. yes. I, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, the pandemic is global. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Everybody has experienced very uh, intimately with um, the issue. Yeah, I and, know. And and then you know it's it's also a, a, a process where different parts of the world um, are you know were cooperating and also as well as was kind of like you know and, and a lot of issues happened um, in in the process. So yeah, I mean you know people. I was always wondering about people in other parts of the world. You know, I have. I lived through the, the the COVID era in the U.S. So mm -hmm. I, I you know, started in China. I'm from China, and then a month later, I started in the U.S. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I lived oh. through the whole process. Yeah. So and, and then, it's, it's very interesting how other countries have have lived that experience because we're talking about yeah. I don't think Mexico recognized that there was a pandemic for a long, long, long time, isn't that, Wendy? Uh, yes, yes, we are uh, still in pandemic. Yeah, yeah, but uh, there's a little bit of reaction. Use, yeah, the use of the mask is uh, still uh, mandatory, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I hope that this ends as soon as possible. Very soon, soon as possible, yeah, anyway. Okay, um, what do you think? It's 10, no, sorry, I'm in Roma time. It's 2.02, 2, so shall we wait another couple of minutes? Yeah, it's university time, you know, 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. Yeah. 
Cynthia, you, I'm sure you, you, you saw Joel uh, presentation of the four crises that we are experimenting. And the first one is the pandemic. I like how you integrate that. I have question. If nobody has question, I have a lot of questions for each of you. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I, I think, you know, the focus of this panel is the creation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's very interesting because I, I remember, you know, I attend a lot of online conferences, including mm -hmm. those in China, and they mm -hmm. were talking about the power of. Uh, um the the right to talk or you know like you know like who is producing knowledge whose knowledge is noticed and used um so what is the discourse basically mm -hmm. i think you know, that's that's very very important because for example um the knowledge produced by academics uh using you know rigorous uh methods and everything is there um it has been um presented but is it the knowledge that is broadcast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by a, a large proportion of the of the society if that were the case then a lot of the things could be um at least some precautions will be taken yeah um you know like i, I have been working in criminology uh, for about nine years now and uh, I was teaching media and criminology. And one of the things is that a lot of people get their knowledge about cr crime from mass media. Mm -hmm. Some mass media channels are serious. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, but, but I mean, the, the picture uh, painted uh, through by mass media is not exactly the same as- Yeah, statistics. that's for sure, that's for sure. Yeah. We were waiting for you, Patty, so we can start the conversation, sorry. I'm just a, a couple of more minutes and then we can start. Um, the colleagues, Friedman, the, the fair video. So, so Wendy and Joel, so you, so you prefer to have a small highlight presentation of the main points or do you want to directly go to the conversation? It's up to you. I'm happy, we're happy either way. Whatever is comfortable for you. Uh, for me, it's okay in every way. Um, <laughs> for you, Joel? Yeah. I'm fine either way. I, I you know, I, 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 I have my, um, I, I brought my notes and. I <laughs> so okay, I, if, if, if you feel I, okay, I, if it is okay I've either way. I've already given it, so I, I can, you know, we can just. Um, uh, it's I'm, I'm sort of getting a sense already that we're having beginning an organic conversation. Yes, 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 so, yes. Uh, why not? Why not build on that? I think that's where maybe the more productive mm -hmm. uh, conversations happen. You know, uh, we all have a lot to say. We all yeah. been yes, thinking we about do. these things for a long time. So um, it may it may just come out in the organic conversation. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Wendy, is that okay for you? Yes, I, so, I agree. So it is, uh, it is two or six, ten or six Toronto time. So let's make it official. Welcome everybody. Uh, letting you know that this conversation is being recorded and closed capture. Uh, follow party instruction. She remind me that we have to do that. <laughs> All right. So how do you want to have this conversation? Do you want to talk about what you found very important in your own research and you and your document as a conversation, not as a presentation, uh, um, to talk about some of the the things you're working. And maybe after that conversation, I have a few questions. Maybe our colleague Patty or Cindy may have another question, but I have a few questions that I don't know how you want to proceed with that. Anybody? Anybody, what is my question here, there? Do you want me to ask question? Will that uh, yes, please. Yeah, yes. Yeah, our question. Okay, if you don't mind, um, if you don't mind, um, Wendy, okay, I have my notes. Okay. Justice for traditional knowledge. Uh, maybe if you can introduce 30 seconds introduction so the rest of us know who you are. 
Okay, uh, some highlights. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, I, I also also bring bring my my. Notes. <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. <laughs> yes. yes. So my highlights are um, uh, intellectual property is defined by national and international positivist law. That mm -hmm. means uh, prevalence of law. Mm -hmm. uh, a diverse proposal, a sui generis legal system highlights, but it is a discursive uh, recognition of diversity because it remains as a vertical framework mm -hmm. generated from a single actor. Therefore, the ecology of knowledge argues the need for two coexistences, which could begin uh, among co-researchers, that is to say, all stakeholders involved in horizontal dialogues uh, for a mutual translation, respecting the symbolic universe of traditional knowledge. And this implies uh, the generation of legal proposals that protect them, assuming differences in an active way. For example, taking into account the management of traditional knowledge from communities uh, themselves, as well as the permanence of criteria for this transmission. Yeah, more or less is. Okay, I have a, a question for you. You talk, uh, okay. anybody have a question? But I do. Through your presentation, you talk about traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? By, it's, it, it's almost evident what you mean, but what do you mean by traditional knowledge? Are you talking in the context of indigenous people or first, uh, first uh, Original uh, pueblo originario and in Spanish. What are you mm -hmm. talking about when you say traditional knowledge? Okay, it's mainly uh, indigenous people. Okay, uh, but uh, it's, uh, they refer also to uh, small communities. Uh, okay. For example, uh, I I don't remember. Uh, could you help me? Carpinteros. Uh, uh -huh. Carpenters. Carpenters, uh, for example, uh, uh, small communities of uh, uh, specific uh, work mm -hmm. as sewing, uh, carpenters, uh, sculpture, I don't know. So, so uh, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about traditional knowledge, you're talking about the indigenous knowledge. And then I like something that you say, you, you, you mentioned this, you Henry system, and then the plural system, and then the ecologies of knowledge. Who define those those terms? Who who define them? Where are they coming from? Uh, the the terms. Yeah, the term. Where are they coming? Uh, for example, uh, legal pluralism is a, a term used uh, from from law. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically uh, talking about the impacts of colonialism you know, in uh, our societies. Uh, uh, all, uh, we have a, a colonial past mm -hmm. and, and this uh, footprint is uh, always or is still present. Yeah. So uh, we are looking for a recovery, uh, a leader or a, a much of the, the original essences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this implies to recognize the, the authorship of traditional knowledge because uh, there is a, a use, a general, general use from them, for example, in uh, traditional uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. And we are looking for uh, the recognition to the original authors and the economic benefits for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a uh, legal pluralism is a, a way to make this, but uh, the problem is legal pluralism is uh, theoretic, the theory, mm -hmm. a theory. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, I recognize the existence of the diversity, but uh, 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 states, uh, they, they are not uh, manage, mm -hmm. uh, managing uh, mm -hmm. in an accurate mode. Mm -hmm. So, um, more or less is there. But the ecology uh, of knowledge, uh, but don't yes. you think that the ecology of knowledge is still remain a little bit theoretical? It's trying to be implemented in different places. Okay. Were your project able to implement that 
Ecology of Knowledge de Dos Santos talk? Yes, yeah, we are looking for that. Uh, in, uh, we are thinking about ways to uh, get together to the communities. For example, talking about the concerns about uh, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. This is the main uh, the main objective. For example, we are look, uh, working with uh, midwives of uh, Edongarikwaro, that is a community near to, to Morelia. Mm -hmm. and uh, Carpenters of Guanajo, in mm -hmm. Joel, uh, also near to, to Morelia. So mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, here, uh, bueno, uh, we are listening the concerts, uh, the ways to uh, registration, the ways to uh, management. Uh, we are trying to uh, uh, create Way, uh, alternative ways uh, that uh, be flexible mm -hmm. for all. Okay. Yes. Anybody have a question? Because I can go ask more questions because I find it very interesting. Uh, anybody have so, a question yeah, or so comment? <laughs> yes, Cindy. Yeah, um, I, I think it is, this is this is very very interesting. Uh, if I heard, um, if I understood uh, Wendy correctly, um, so it's it's really about how to um, you know advocate for knowledge produced by the indigenous people and people in the community, um, and 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 you are also applying the uh, the knowledge um, in the community uh, to the community. Uh, so that you know communities can be served um so since that you know seems to me that that was uh what wendy i uh, just presented i think that is great um i guess my question i think from my first uh, session i think i didn't say this but I, I think um if i summarize that session correctly it is that we want to find hope mm -hmm. by uh recognizing um, the mistakes and the problems in the society. Um, and so for, so my question to you is in the process of producing the knowledge by the community and uh, the indigenous community, um, what, are the, what are the issues that you run into in terms of producing uh, the knowledge and, uh, and also um, having the society to recognize the importance, the significance of the knowledge. Um, and also when the knowledge is applied to the community to serve the community, um, what are the support and challenges that you have, uh, you have uh, encountered? Thanks. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, uh, there are a lot of challenges about this. And, uh, in the, in the case of Michoacan, uh, one sub important support is the, uh, uh, the recognition from the, uh, how do you say, the, the plan uh, of governments uh, in the plan, uh, see, the, in the plan uh, is recognized traditional medicine and the my wife, midwives, no? Mm -hmm. So uh, this, uh, uh, means uh, uh, programs as uh, economic support to uh, highlight this uh, this knowledge, no. And uh, another challenge I think is the economic uh, cost to register intellectual property. So I, I think this is this is the uh, the main uh, thing to to talk about with a uh, federal government because uh, intellectual property in Mexico is uh, federal, it's not for states. So uh, I think this is the, the, big, the big challenge for uh, uh, a better uh, recognition, registration of intellectual property. And the uh, uh, understanding of uh, all of us uh, about the differences of knowledge and the importance of, of knowledge. Thank you. Anybody? Thank you very much. Okay, anybody else? Can I continue asking questions? Wendy, it's gonna be a, can I continue okay. asking questions? You know, uh, 
Is there, okay, you talk about uh, there is the Michigan government planning process that introduced okay. indigenous knowledge, okay? So uh, when it comes to research, may I ask you how you as a researcher of, 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 of your team, because I understand you belong to a larger team within the university. How, okay, do you have ethical component that demand that you're engaged in certain action in a way that you don't, you know, colonialism appropriates knowledge, ignore knowledge, doesn't provide credit to who, who owns the knowledge. Is, is it a, do you have an ethical um, research process to carry on? The, the reason I'm asking you is uh, some of the partners I work don't have social science ethical uh, protocol, which make it very, very easy. Does that make sense? Do you yes, have that? Yes. Yes. Uh, Yes, it's a ethical point that is important, uh, and for is a uh, traditional knowledge. Um, I I be working with uh, midwives, uh, experts of uh, plants. Uh, I I have uh, learned about a little about mm -hmm. this knowledge, but I am not uh, spreading this knowledge because <laughs> I don't have authorization. Mm -hmm. But in a co-research exercise, I went uh, with them to mm -hmm. learn to learn a little. So uh, is spread is uh, writing about uh, uh, the things I have uh, I have received uh, authorization. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little. Uh, the ethical component mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we are looking for the respect for the recognition to the uh, true authorship. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I cannot uh, uh, spread in this, this knowledge uh, um, without this authorization. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's the principal uh, ethical point no? mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, always uh, question May I write about this? Uh, what can, uh, what could I uh, to say about that? No, mm -hmm. or this uh, that that persons are uh, sharing me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Any question? Any comment? Yeah, uh, Joel. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think, that, I mean, you're obviously talking about something extremely important here. Uh, Joel, you, 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 your volume is very low. Ah, okay. Let me let me try to. Is this better? Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was uh, I was thinking you're you, that when you're talking about this extremely important subject, and and I think that uh, I think one thought I have it is uh, it may not be a question, but it's just sort of to express like this tension between the protection of knowledge and the need to not inappropriately appropriate indigenous knowledge and at the same time there's this terrible need in the world for uh or tremendous need in the world for a larger pluralistic conversation uh that brings indigenous knowledge and particularly indigenous worldviews into the conversation of the whole of the world mm -hmm. and um uh, in order to create a, a, a counterbalance to Western dominated knowledge and culture. And so, there, you know, there's, the, there's the, the tension of not wanting to appropriate and then, and then, the, um, and then the, need for, um, uh, the need for this kind of knowledge. And I think that's, where, that, that's, a, that's a tension that, that I've seen kind of repeated over and over in, mm -hmm. different, in different conversations. In different contexts, and uh, uh, and I do, you know, have a lot of respect for the idea that there are in many different traditions the idea that, you know, that that certain knowledge is held within the community uh, and it's held within just held within whatever that community is, and then there's the question of um, at what point, for example. Uh, we have the vaccines for COVID and the, uh, you know, because of intellectual property, um, the vaccines are not, you know, uh, being disseminated uh, on an equal basis throughout the world. 
is there is there you know this is a, just a, a, a provocative question is there a parallel between the the notion that um of um of uh prohibiting cultural appropriation and intellectual property for things that are valuable for the for humankind at a time when humankind needs those uh pieces of knowledge I don't know that anybody here can answer the question, but it's yeah. just, it's a big question. I just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Yes, yes. There is a, a real tension about the needs of the world. Uh, for example, in the in the subject of, of health, uh, but the uh, the the we are looking for the recognition of authorship and. After the recognition, uh, economic benefits. Uh, this is the main point, I think. Uh, we have to say that uh, we are also looking for uh, benefit, uh, economic benefits for the original actors. No, uh, is is the is the thing is the is the point mm -hmm. that we uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult to to say that in these terms in these subjects, but it is important. And this is the principal uh, aspect for every uh, kind of knowledge, the, the recognition the, uh, the, of the authorship, mm -hmm. who, who is the, the bearer, no? or who uh, can uh, exploit the benefits. Mm -hmm. I'm, I follow what Joel is saying, if I might, if I may. Um, it's actually more closer what you say, Wendy, when you talk, uh, cite uh, Bonaventura de Santos that we need to have intercultural among mm -hmm. different cultures and, and, and the way they understand the world. It is very hard for some all of us that have been trained and educated in the Eurocentric way of understanding the world to, to give the same value to the other one. Do you find that it's an issue? Because uh, you know, we that notion that let's provincialize Europe and the knowledge they produce um, is a very important knowledge. But then, how how do we go about? I think I'm repeating what Joel said. How do we go about recognizing certain traditional knowledge without making it universal uh, in that particular space? You know, uh, I'm not making sense because. I keep telling the colonization is not a universal concept. It's a spatial and temporal. How people and, and Michoacan have been colonized, both externally and internally, and epistemological, may be different to the indigenous people here in Canada. So yes. how, I don't know if you have the answer for that, but how do you, how do you balance that tension? Because we want to respect indigenous knowledge. We do. We must. There is not a choice. But at the same time, I'm sorry, Joel, I'm sort of repeating what you say, but at the same time, it is important that there is an intercultural communication and translation how those knowledge, knowledge that knowledge is, is, is used and who benefits. Yes. The Canadian indigenous people have, oh, sorry, they will kill me if I say that, the indigenous First Nations in Canada called the concept the two eyes concept I, mean, I think you all communities the two eyes things that do in reality doing research you go through the indigenous process first and then you invite the outsider usually university to come and work together to create a research project that has both eyes the traditional and the western both parallel to the process so what do you think i'm just breaking uh, that is the most beautiful uh, issue about this because every group, uh, every community is different. Even in Michoacan, there are different groups mm -hmm. uh, and there are different uh, ways to, to see uh, the, the reality. Uh, and it depends, it also depends on the, the perception about colonialism no? mm -hmm. and, and these uh, barriers uh, to countries between countries, no? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, in Mexico, uh, we have uh, uh, 
dra uh, perception of drama about colonialism, no? And there are many uh, ideas that uh, is uh, that uh, uh, is 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 uh, permanent. Mm -hmm. It remains, you, yeah. The, the colonial the, trauma remains, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Ha, remains. So uh, I think in, in Michoacán, uh, Michoacán uh, the perspective is different uh, because uh, I have seen uh, in another states, uh, it, it seems that we have to hide all traditional knowledge because uh, there are uh, uh, modern uh, ways, technologies, but in Michoacán is an important issue. And it, it, uh, it, uh, for this, we, we can talk about the, this with different groups. Mm -hmm. So I, I think every group uh, has its uh, uh, particularities. No? And we had to see, to, to see uh, every group. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a big, big world that uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we have no, uh, we, bueno, uh, we, we don't have life for every. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah. For every group, for every reality, but uh, I think that uh, for this uh, is uh, intercultural translation, you not know, to to try to intend to to know this difference and ways to work together. Mm -hmm. Not always it's possible, but we are trying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. When any other. Comments, question? We'll come back, Wendy. We'll come back. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, very no, no. Much. Okay. Stay with us in the conversation. Joel, do you wanna share your knowledge or do you want us do you want us to ask questions? Um well I'll just say uh the uh I think that the the what what I was talking about in my presentation, the, the one that I did online. That really um, uh, is my life work. Uh, it, it's uh, it, when I kind of reflect on it um, in, in this moment that it's it's the the life work is the work of trying to find ways to create solidarity across cultures and across um, social movements and to try to build on a sort of uh, a broader global beloved community or cosmopolitan worldview that would be very inclusive and yet not imperialistic in the sense that <laughs> these conversations are interrelated so that so that there's not a cultural appropriation of one from the other but that there's a, a deep appreciation of um of the different various cultures. The one thing that come, a couple of things that come just to mind, things that I didn't present, and maybe that's the best way to go about it, is talk about things that I didn't present about. It, it, it was just occurring to me as we were just talking was um, um, one of my, uh, one of the books that uh, changed my life the, uh, tremendously was uh, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And um, one of the things that his experience was, was to bring uh, his charge from his teacher was for him to bring um, uh, uh, the cultural uh, wisdom of India, broadly speaking, and, and of, and of uh, various religions within, traditions within India um, to the West because it was so needed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he brought, he, he did bring that and, um, uh, and, and began this kind of cultural dialogue. Now, of course, there's this, uh, there's a backlash about people saying that yoga um, is uh, being culturally appropriated uh, mm -hmm. by, uh, you know, because it doesn't have the uh, it, it's not, it, it, it's used as um, uh, whatever it's called, uh, aerobicize. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of like people trying to use it as an exercise technique to strengthen your muscles and to do whatever instead of to um, have a spiritual dimension. And it's losing that, that, that deep spiritual dimension, which is the point of bringing it here in the first place, if, it he, if here means the United States or to Western, Western cultures. And so 
there's then this notion of um, this long tradition of the theos first with the Theosophical Society that uh, had uh, in you know in the uh, I think from the late teen 1800s to all the way through to today um, having this idea that there could be some true dialogue about what are finding commonalities across religions. Mm -hmm. Then there's the the uh, Parliament of Religions process where mm -hmm. um, they are uh, attempting again to do that same thing and this notion of uh, uh, what um, uh, is, is Father Wayne uh, who was one of the fa one of the leaders of the uh, the re revisiting of the World Parliament of Religions and began the new process of uh, having those conferences uh, was saying this idea of interspirituality that we can all learn from each other that there are commonalities but that there are differences and that we can kind of learn from each other f it, it, it's a kind of much more pluralistic mm -hmm. uh, and I think pluralism has gotten a bad name mm -hmm. in, in a sense but but the idea of genuinely being pluralistic about uh, cultures Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, you know, the, 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 the talk that I gave was very political mm -hmm. and it was really about um, the fact that, um, that there are, that really we are in this era of autocracy versus um, democracy and democracy in the broad sense in, the, in that pluralistic sense that I'm talking about. Uh, that would be able to incorporate and to bring together people from different cultures versus this kind of um, hyper-nationalist, patriarchal, uh, uh, extreme capitalist, extreme um, um, racist, uh, mm -hmm. xenophobic worldview. And the, the point that I was making is uh, in, in one sentence would be that um, you know, uh, th there's a cartoon that says uh, that that shows you know the the big fish attacking the little f uh, you know all the little fish and then the the little fish all kind of band together and and attack the big fish. I think that this it's it's the time for solidarity. If ever there was a time for solidarity, and, and it's got to be solidarity, I think on a global level. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, in order to defeat this really terrible um, upsurge of um, authoritarian energy in the world. And in order for that to happen, there needs to be a, a new resurgence of, um, of, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I sometimes call it, you know, pluralistic, I'll sometimes use the word topian versus utopian, uh, but it, the idea of it is, it is is to have a beloved community in the Martin Luther King sense of that word that is an inclusive community and that respects other people's rights and also not just respects them, but it takes care of other people's needs in the community. So it's a genuine uh, community on a global level. And so, um, uh, so maybe I'll pause there. That, those are that. That's the big thought. The mm -hmm. big thought is time. It's it's been time, and that's why I say it's my life work. Mm -hmm. Is that I, my my work over time has just been various iterations of saying this same thing, which is that we um, we need to have a global vision. We need to sort of you know see the world in a global context, and to bring everybody up into that conversation. Um, and who wants to be part of the conversation and to, um, and then to defeat in a literal sense, politically, the forces that would, um, make everything, um, based on power and a control and greed and the worst human impulses. <laughs> I, yeah, go ahead, bud. Um, Okay, I, I want to play a little bit of devil's advocate here. <clears throat> and this is more rhetorical than um, uh, than trying to challenge you per se, but there there is, well, two thoughts came to mind. One is I'm really glad you used the word solidarity 
instead of the word unity. Mm -hmm. I think that there has been, and this is very colonial in nature, this idea that somehow in order to have an inclusive um, grouping, if you will, that it has to be unified in some way, that it has to be a unification of purpose or of allegiance and so forth. And I think that that's a really important distinction because there is a really wicked history of, of um, kind of forcing unity on people that it always it almost always comes with conformity right after. <laughs> so I'm very happy that you use that. But the thing that concerns me about this idea of global solidarity is that I think that sociologically, and I, and I, this is a my own kind of personal project. Okay, so you're tapping into something that I think about a lot. I I think that most movements, even when they're big global movements in the end, start very small with small groups of people doing problem solving. In other words, they don't start out by saying, let's have a movement. Mm -mm. They don't start out by saying, let's, you know, um, one of the examples I use in my classes is uh, the Canadian healthcare system. So a lot of people see it, you know, in Canada, the, I can't remember the name of the guy, but the MP in the 1960s who mm -hmm. came up with this idea and, and it just all of a sudden everybody was like, yes, let's have healthcare, right? But if you look at the history of it, it started provincially. Mm -hmm. It didn't start as a federal program. It started in, in provinces. And when it started working in these places, then other people are like, yeah, I want that. And it moved into a national policy. Mm. And I wonder the practical implications of what I'm suggesting is how do you, how can you build a global solidarity one little group at a time? You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think that the key might be problem solving. Mm -hmm. I think that most of the time there, um, and, and I think it's a process thing rather than a solution thing. Let me explain what I mean. Um, a case history that I did in graduate school was a program in San Antonio called Quest. Um, it is a, um, a program that emerged in the 1980s when Levi Strauss left San Antonio and moved to Mexico. And with it went uh, good paying uh, jobs that most of the local um, population there who were working class, that they had good paying jobs through Levi Strauss, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the jeans, sewing blue jeans, right? So the Texas wanted to give them like, you know, job training and education and all the usual policy stuff that you do when people lose a lot of jobs. But they started having um, basically little town meetings. They were, they were kind of like house meetings, like 10, 15 people together. It was mostly organized through a church. There was a priest who organized um, different meetings and they started asking questions about, well, what do, you know, how can we really get these new skills? And what do these new skills mean to us? And what do we need? And how are we going to go back to get training and all this stuff? And what they came up with is connecting this training to real jobs, right? So they went out and actually lobbied people, you know, companies in the area and said, if you are going to support this person in getting job training, then you need to provide childcare for them. You need to provide uh, some sort of income to take care of them while they're in school and they need to know that there's work at the end, right? 
And mm -hmm. so this emerged into the program that is now called Quest. And then it really worked in San Antonio. It was very good. It still exists, right? I did this case study in 1996. I looked it up just last year and it's still going strong. They tried to move it to Houston, right? But they didn't do all of the grassroots mm -hmm. stuff. And Houston, it was like a done program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now we know how to do it. <laughs> and they, you know, and it didn't work in Houston. I mean, this is the same state, same kind of population, et cetera. And the reason is because the buy-in that was in the community in San Antonio wasn't there. It went from a bottom-up, grassroots, problem-solving, invested thing to a government telling you this is what you need to do, right? Even though probably if it had been a grassroots thing in Houston, it would have probably looked very similar when it was done. So I'm wondering if one of the ways that, uh, just to bring this back to what you were talking about, Joel, if one of the ways to build that kind of solidarity is not so much trying to share goals or share um, uh, like these generalized kind of things that we talk about, but to share process, right? Instead of saying, we need to take care of this, this thing, that thing, or the other thing, look, we need to be together. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the ways to build this kind of solidarity is to talk about the ways in which people interact with each other, the ways in which people um, build on these kind of localized problem solving. So that what we're sharing with each other is not so much the answers to those problems, but the methodology of how to go about listening to each other, empathizing with each other, um, empowering each other, and so forth. And I, you know, I'm just I'm I worry sometimes when I hear sociologists talk in big picture terms that we miss the kind of middle part that actually has to happen in real people's lives when they really are faced with real situations. And I wonder if what you think of all of that, you know, this, that just sort of came to mind when you were talking about this idea of a global solidarity. And I'll shut up now. So um, I think that was uh, directed to, uh, for a response for me. I think uh so many things that my main my main response is that you said several different things and i want to kind of highlight the several different things that you said uh and i agree with all of them um so um i don't know that we're going to have you know uh, if the, the point you know and i and i guess that's part of the pro that's part of the process that we're trying to to create here is a is a is a kind of problem solving where we're not sharing the answers and we're and we're, you know, we're we're learning how to do process. So I agree very much on on that notion, and I'm I, I am going to culturally appropriate that idea, you know, that it's beautifully said. Sharing goal, you know, not sharing goals, but sharing process. I think that you can. I think you can do a bit of both of those. I think that um, just on that one point, um, I think that um, having having deep values like I, like I, I mentioned the Bertrand Russell Einstein manifesto <laughs> where uh, they said you know remember your humanity and forget the rest <laughs> um, that that becomes a basis if you really do that then you remembering your humanity is uh, to remember not just a principle of humanity it's to remember that you need to be kind to others in the process and you need to have a, a kind of uh, compassion toward others. Uh, so I, I very much agree with I very much agree with that idea of sharing not sharing goals but sharing process, um, but also having some or and also having some overarching values that inform the dialogue. It's sort of like this idea of uh, content moderation on Twitter. If you don't have um, if, if there's no, if, if you let every idea in, you will let in, if you, if you don't say we're going to have respectful dialogue, 
um, and you don't allow for every idea. And, and some of the some of the people would come in and they would kind of bomb the ideas. You know, the if you have a four chan discussion versus a, a current Twitter discussion that's moderated, and people can be thrown out or or you know reprimanded for attacking other people or threatening other people so that we have a respectful dialogue so i think that there's a there's a balance there um and um and i and what you said um about solidarity versus unity uh at the mm -hmm. you know i want to shift back to that other point um patty is that you know i couldn't agree more and i you know very much chose that word solidarity I, I i use that i i use that word coming out of other languages but it also is my language in and of itself it's it's really that idea of um of not having one world view and i think that's what i think that of course is what threatens the right in their their fear as they try to impose their one world view of uh you know uh uh, you know, to paraphrase bell hooks, a patriarchal um, capitalist, um, you know, you know, gender conforming world on top of the entire world. Um, but they yet have this fear of having the globalists impose the world mm -hmm. on, on them. So I think that um, some of the fears of maybe these different groups are the same, but I, I think I think that that what you're saying, uh, Patty, my my response would be, I agree. And what you're saying about process versus um, the uh, the goals, I think is something that I I, I think is something I'm really going to want to think about more and and to try to think about how I emphasize in my own work the process not the goals. I think that's a really good point. So that, that, that's my response. Uh, if I may, uh, Joel, there's a few things that I really like. You talk about the intersectional solidarity. The intersection, I, I think that's a, it's, it's almost a similar what Patty is saying, let's, let's not use a un, unity silences. We know that the unity silences voices. I, when you talk about intersectional solidarities, do you, well, you present a few examples, you know, the, uh, Black Lives Matter in different parts of the world. I think one movement that I think will reflect somewhat what Patty is saying is the environmental movement. It's reflecting different parts of the world differently, but ultimately there is a goal. And the other thing that I really, really like alike is if we're going to engage, I'm paraphrasing, if we're going to engage with the other, humility has to be present. I mean, academics are not very well known for being humble, isn't it? Because we know it all. So, but how do you, I'm teasing Wendy, it's a broma. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you engage in that process? Uh, do you have any experience uh, in the ground that uh, allow you to to present that notion of intersectional through humility. And I don't think you talk about naive Pollyanna way of understanding the world. It's a, it's, it's a humility with knowledge, a humility understanding of your limitation, humility putting other knowledge at the same level of your knowledge. Is that how you are? presenting it, I just interpret it that way. Yeah, I, I think that I am just learning, you know, the, the various dimensions of what is meant by intersectional. I think that, you know, there's the classic definition that if, you know, that uh, of Audre Lorde of, 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 you know, we, you know, we, we live, uh, uh, there are different dimensions to our lives, you know, <laughs> that, 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 you know, the, the, the classic example would be a, you know, a black trans person who, you know, there's the, the black part of that person, the trans part of that person, and that that's combining together in one person. And so we have to respect the different parts of that person. And that's bringing that whole idea of intersectionality forward. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other piece of it is that um, 
you know, I do have this idea that 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 can seem like the all lives mattering of intersectionality, which is hmm. to say that uh, the ultimate I believe that the ultimate intersectionality is our common humanity, you mm -hmm. know, that 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 because because that is it, that is a part of us. So we can all identify as whatever we're going to identify as. But but the common humanity and that gets to the core value. But uh, of um, our, of our common humanity as a, as a basis for all of the work that we do. Um, I'm trying to get back to the you know you were asking this question. Maybe restate the restate the question again uh, about intersectionality of what you were asking for because I think I. Have no, a it wasn't a, it wasn't a question. I was just wanting you to 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 ex and to explore a little bit more that that concept because. The concept of solidarity tend to be thematic, isn't it? and you gave some examples in your presentation: environmental, women's, uh, people with disability, and others. Uh, that is intersectional uh, solidarity, which is reflect what Patty is saying. You are not looking for unity; you are looking to to go parallel, working. Together and you cite the the uh, I think it is uh, the Australia Indigenous person. Uh, but if you come with that to look for a liberation, let's work together. So it wasn't a comment. It was it wasn't a question. It was more a comment that this is the first time I, I work a lot about intersection. Now that's all we talk here in, in the university here. Uh, but when you move in into the person to the social and to a social movement, it generates a new way of interpretation. I don't know. I'm paraphrasing a lot of the stuff that you say. For me, that taking how I see it, it taking consideration what Pat is saying, that the global doesn't start in the global, it starts in the local, globalization. That's what we call, you know, that the sociology term of globalization. The local is is global and the global is local. The global, the global south is in the global north now and the global north. So that's what I really like the concept in uh, intersectional solidarity. I'm, have you written about that? Have you have you get that information somewhere else? That would be very good to explore. But sorry, Joel, but I'm sorry, that's a concept that I have loved a lot for many years, is I call it academic or epistemology humility. I mean, that's how I, in my right I call it epistemology. So when you bring, we are going to engage with others as long as we bring certain solidarity, humility to engage in the process. I don't know, what do you think? I'm just trying to understand how you present it. It's not a question, it's just a conversation. Do you agree? How, how, I, I do agree. I, I, th I think it is, it is, I think you, I, I agree with how you framed it and that's how I view it as well. Which is that the humility is is the essential element of it, uh, and, and it's not just humility to lower yourself. It's humility to be able to look other people in the eye, and to listen to them enough so that you really are, are and quiet yourself a bit, so that you can listen to what they have to say and to and you can hear the complexity of who they are. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I, you know, I didn't get a chance. There's so many things to put in, and I didn't put it in this presentation. I'd put it in another. Is um, Charlene Carruthers, who is an uh, activist in in um, in Chicago, wrote a book called Unapologetic, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and she talks about it's a black queer uh, 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 book on. Um, uh, organizing from an intersectional point of view, and and you and, and and she uses the word queer in a sense to mean that it's a broad kind of overarching term that means different from the norm almost, mm -hmm. and different from the sort of cultural patriarchal norm of what society is, and it's this umbrella term, and that people could be fit within that within that. And then mm -hmm. we need to cherish all those people that fit within that norm who have 
who have been uh, oppressed in that way. And, and, but the flip side is, is that to me, queer is not sufficient. You know, that's where you get to the, the intersectional thing. First of all, there's, there's, it, it, you know, there's Latinx queer people, Jewish queer people, black queer people, uh, you know, uh, people of every color and uh, denomination who are queer people, then the question is, is queer a big enough term? Mm -hmm. um, and what I would say is you want to like, uh, in a sense, queer the world. You want to like say that, that, that this, whatever, whatever that notion of queer is, whatever that notion of is a radical acceptance of, of this, um, uh, uh, this differentiality down to the individual person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every that you know that that every single person is a different version of of queer. Of a, mm -hmm, of a, mm -hmm. Or also, I would say every every single person is a different version of what it is to be a human being. So when you know, I go back to like to Gandhi when he said that you know, uh, truth is like light and, and it goes through a prism and, and the prism it ha actually has an infinite set of, uh, an infinite rainbow of, uh, of possibilities and, and, and nonviolence is the, uh, the act or the process to go back to Patty's term is the process by which we recognize that infinite display of beauty of truth of the truth of of however whatever it is five billion however many billion people we are on the planet right now mm -hmm. we recognize that beauty of every single individual and group and then we we try to respect all of that and in and in that respect and maybe in to pick up again on patty in the process of of engaging with respect maybe the the harmony maybe instead of unity maybe the harmony is found mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah wendy you want to say something you were shaking your head that sort of yes. agree yeah go ahead <laughs> yes 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 uh, uh, from your presentation uh, overview effect resonates with me but uh, not from the moon from internet, no. Uh, my question is uh, a better understanding of web uh, resources contribute to the contemporary overview effect? Or um, another question, sorry. How we digital immigrants could become part of this movement? Do you say digital digital immigrants? Uh -huh. The okay. difference uh, having uh, native uh, uh, digital natives and uh -huh. oh. digital. Uh, yeah, yeah. Joe talks about that. Or talk about that. Yes, uh, I think that uh, a better understanding of uh, web resources uh, uh, for digital uh, natives is uh, makes uh, more easy this mm -hmm. um, this mo movement. No, uh, for mm -hmm. us uh, immigrants, no. Uh, could, could, could we could could we take part of that uh, movement? Could could we uh, understand uh, this diversity, uh, this uh, need to 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 anti-racist, to uh, global solidarity? Oh, you you throw in another element here. You know, if I. <laughs> If I can paraphrase, if I understood correctly, uh, just Wendy. So what you're saying is, uh, uh, is technology, digital technology, uh, can be different between the native and the immigrant technology, and how both groups can participate within the solidarity yes. movement. All right. Yes, in terms of approach to to the understanding of of this reality of the diversity. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That's a really good question. <laughs> I know. I know. That's really it's very question. interesting. Uh, you know, I can throw out an answer if you want, or throw out a first thought, which is not, um, and I don't want to, if somebody else in the group, I've been talking a lot, if somebody else wants to respond to that first. Okay. I mean, my first thought is, um, um, 
that um, I think that you know there are the the that there are. First of all, I was using digital native and digital immigrant as a metaphor uh, <laughs> for um, for this idea of people being um, for the what I call the what you know what some people call the overview effect of of people having that sense that we are you know if you if you see the planet mm -hmm. obviously indigenous in, indigenous cultures have had this idea uh, from their own internal. Um, spiritual work that 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 they've done to know that all things are interconnected and that the that the that the whole universe is interconnected and that the world is is one world and that 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 we're all part of a fabric uh, for people coming particularly from western cultures where they everything is divided up i think that's where the that that's the where one of the things where the value of um this overview effect of literally having a picture that science or you know that we have a picture we see you, you can't deny that picture that that the world is one one small planet and that we are all one humanity um and that all of those boundaries that we draw on the on the old maps are just fake our fake mm -hmm. boundaries, and that and and um, uh, and so uh, so there so there's that, and then and then there's the question of I think you were actually talking about when you tell me you were not talking about the metaphor, you were actually talking about how how people in the indigenous communities can participate in the in the internet world um, uh, as uh, digital um, uh, proficient. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were really asking? Not about my metaphor, right? What? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, um, because I think that um, this is not about, but it's about intercultural, but uh, it's also about intergenerational inter, yeah. uh, okay. understanding. So uh, I, I saw, I listened to my students, uh, I, I find in them another view, you know, and uh -huh. a different uh, overview, this, this global overview, you know, this uh, overview effect. And they have a, uh, a more a uh, notion of diversity, but uh, I think uh, we, uh, as uh, digital immigrants, uh, sometimes we don't have uh, the the resources or the the theories or the no I don't know the the words to understand uh, this movement. Uh, is um, women, well, women maybe, yes, but um, L L LGBT, or LGBT. Um, mm -hmm. LGBT so, uh -huh. yeah. yes, mm -hmm. see, I, I think uh, it's also intergenerational and uh, it has a, uh, there, has a, there is a concept on life, mm -hmm. uh, the, the effect uh, of the, our life is, is not, uh, doesn't have boundaries uh, uh, from the virtual to the real. Mm -hmm. And I think that this makes uh, these movements uh, spread in a, in a big way, no? Well, you know, actually, I remember in the presentation from Joel talking about how the Egyptian revolution, the Arab Spring Wall and all the stuff, Technology was a key component within that component, but at the same, that was key component, but on the same, there's more and more studies that the virtual technology and the everyday living technology sometimes blur, sometimes blur that, you know, originally, our, my generation think to believe the virtual world is a different world. It's no reality. It doesn't exist. It is a real, especially for the young people, it is a reality they are living that is different from the notion we have ourselves during at least my generation. But the other component that I see is also um, um, the digital make also the same way like uh, the pandemic made visible 
disparities, inequalities, digital has also made that evident. Countries that have only 10 to 15% internet penetration, uh, mostly in urban areas. Uh, class who, who has access to that, who has access to a smartphone, who has, so that I think make that division a little bit more evident into the process. And uh, age, in, in this case, age is a factor, isn't it? Uh, which generation will belong into that reality? But very interesting study that I'm carrying on with the Central America and the diaspora. I'm just uh, collecting data, mining data, how they use, use social media to strengthen the human rights in authoritarian country. The data that is coming is quite interesting. I don't understand it because it's somebody in media who's doing it, but show how sometimes it's not a parallel world, it's an integrated world that for my generation is very difficult to grasp it because we live here in the body, as you mentioned, Wendy, but um, I'm just rambling because that's the stuff. Uh, Henry, yeah. I think that, yeah, one of the things that you just said before we mm -hmm. lose it, there's also the flip side of that. Okay. The digital world lives in the real world too. There uh -huh. is an integration, but it isn't just that young people flip back and forth between these two constructed worlds, but also, I mean, you mentioned, you know, who has a phone and who doesn't, who has access and who doesn't. There are some people who don't have electricity, much less, <laughs> exactly. you know, exactly. or don't have electricity that's dependable and so <laughs> forth. So there's a real material reality to the digital world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is something that came up um, when, you know, the idealistic Bitcoin stuff went on. And then all of a sudden we found out that it's just so carbon intensive <laughs> to create and mine Bitcoin, you know. And I'm like thinking to myself, no, this is all cyberspace. How can it be carbon intensive? And then I realized, oh yeah, because electricity. <laughs> and so, and we're, and I mean, we're sitting here looking at like a international crisis right now of energy, right? With all of that's going on with the war and everything in Europe. And we, we really are like, it's going to impact maybe, you know, North America, not so much, but a lot of the world, it's just, if you don't have coal, you don't have gas, you don't have these things, you don't have electricity. Mm -hmm. You don't have dependable electricity. And I mean, you might not even have dependable electricity in Europe. Mm -hmm. So if this continues in any kind of large crisis. So yeah, I agree that it's like young people are, like it's a fluid kind mm -hmm. of thing between the two worlds, mm -hmm. but that digital world really does live in a material world as well. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that affects the inequality that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that your point that in the same way that the pandemic brought forth and made clear, I guess is the best word, um, these inequalities in systems, um, this digital asset, I really like that concept. I know it was a metaphor, but it, it really is kind of true that there are digital immigrants, digital refugees, and digital natives. And a lot of that has to do with access to resources. <laughs> and I mean, things that I know I take for granted. You know, like last night, I, there was an electrical storm here in Kansas while I'm trying to finish my grades and set all this stuff up. And I'm like, don't go out, don't light. <laughs> and I'm like typing going, oh, please, no, don't take the electricity away. And I thought, you know, that's like normal for a lot of people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one of the things that I worry about with this conference as an organizer is we have very, very little representation in Africa. Mm -hmm. We have people coming from all over the world and we have no African scholars. Uh, direct to African scholars. And I thought about, well, why has that happened? And one of the reasons that I think it's happened is just simply access. Mm -hmm. That this is a, you know, we like to talk about 
neutral carbon conferences and you know nearly neutral carbon conferences and all this kind of stuff and how accessible it is and everything but that gap was really obvious mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. we organized this that there yeah. is just this part of the world that is not i mean it's getting there you know i don't want to make it i don't want to paint this you know those people are those people are Orientalize them yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i'm not trying to say that but i mean there is that reality that it it isn't easy to get electricity it isn't easy to get cell towers it isn't easy to get a lot of the things that make this possible, possible. Mm -hmm. yeah so go sorry go ahead josephine and then cindy yes um i i think this is a great point uh yes um i have never been to africa um, but I've read something about the digital divide uh, in the world mm -hmm. and uh, the internet um, access in Africa is very unreliable. Um, so, so I think, yes, you're right. One of the reasons probably, uh, you know, one of the reasons that they cannot present is probably the unreliable internet connection. And I think there's another component uh, to the uh, virtual world, which is supposed to benefit uh, everybody, particularly during COVID, you know, everything is transmitted electronically, is that um, not only the technology that supports uh, internet connection, but also the technology that is, I mean, you know, like inter internet connection is supposed to be something, well, I mean, it, it's it's supposed to be beneficial, although it's, it's sometimes it's neutral, you know, when it is, useful um, beneficial purposes like a conference and everything mm -hmm. it is beneficial to people um, unless you know no, somebody cannot afford that but it's also neutral in the sense that uh, just like you know bureaucracy can benefit the hu hum humanity with production right hunger is reduced <laughs> but it also makes Nazi Germany possible. Mm. So what I'm saying is that technology in terms of internet connection really benefits as long as people can afford. At the same time, uh, cybersecurity is an issue. You know, I think, you know, I remember some time ago when I was attending, I can't remember which conference, and then there was this um, pornography comes into the, conf you know, the, the process. Obviously, somebody hacked. Um, the, the the conference. So I think you know for those who have resources to um, control the technology, you know. Um, so I think you know, of course, you know. I I, I don't hope this happens to every, everybody, but once we we, we access internet resources to produce knowledge and everything, but what if somebody hacks um, a conference? a data source, you know, a data set and everything. And then, you know, it's it's even more difficult for us to detect, right? Um, because, you know, if we go to a conference, we know uh, we are accessing the right people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to make the flight and everything. But if it is online and you're not, uh, you know, uh, uh, an expert in terms of cybersecurity and everything, and you, you use that data set or whatever for a long time, it turns mm -hmm. out to be false. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in that aspect, there's also the, um, the uh, equal accessibility um, or equal access to technology as well. Um, so I think, yeah, this is to have an equal conversation. This is just a, a technology, access to technology. Uh, the knowledge of technology is, is very, very important. And Josephine, just give me a sentence, but technology has facilitated the construction of the transnational subject tool, hasn't it? Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Josephine? Yeah, I wanted to, not to, to create too much overlap, but this, we're going to cover some of this in, in detail on the um, advancing minorities in academia, invited conversation that we have on Friday, because we found that that even with uh, near non-existence cellular uh, internet, people want to communicate yeah, across yeah. borders, across yeah. the globe. Um, 
And it's not always the case of the global north inviting in the global south, but it's also a reciprocal facilita facilitation of communication between people, or I would say across people. Mm -hmm. um, we've, uh, during the pandemic and before, created communities across academic disciplines where we talk to people at all four corners of the globe, and we just make sure that we have a five minute break at the top of every hour. So if people do not have good bandwidth, good internet, if they can just log in for those five minutes, then mm -hmm. they can participate and they can be involved on equal footing. Um, mm -hmm. And it has really changed. It has changed how certain people uh, behave in the global north in their settings. And it has also invited in and created collaborations across boundaries and across um, across hemispheres, I would like to say. But we've seen even, I mean, we we through storms, through uh, um, both planned and unplanned electrical cuts in South Africa and in the Indian context, the people still are mm -hmm. extremely resilient and find ways, which links back to Paddy's idea of that it's about problem solving, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's about problem solving. And if we, if we link to the ideas of human rights, that it's about the highest attainable standard, well, if this is the highest attainable standard at the moment, mm -hmm. then we need to find ways of working with that until a higher standard is attainable, right? Yeah. So, so I think that, of course, this is an easy thing to say <laughs> coming mm -hmm. from a Scandinavian context where, where you know, in fiber is considered a human right. So, um, <laughs> uh, but I do think that there are ways of working around and, and where there are no ways, we have to identify pathways um, in order to include um, but I do think that it's very often discussed as the inclusion of the minority in the majority. And I have been actively working on the idea, which links back to the topic of this of this panel, right? The idea of that we should see it just as much as the inclusion of us uh, in other contexts where we should be um, just as involved and just as engaged. Um, yeah. Josephine, you remind, me, you remind me of something that my spirit in Dominican Republic the internet penetration is very low, but 95% of the people have cheap telephone, very cheap telephone, five or $10 that they buy the data just three or four minutes to be able to communicate. So, sort of I mean, that's what we had, that's what we had <laughs> here in the 90s. And, and ah, so, exactly. So it's exactly. about time, right? So I think that we should already now pave the way towards a conversation that is going to be happening. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of time. All right, Joel, Wendy, any brilliant conclusion comment? Uh, no? No? Okay, anybody else? Are we? Well, I think we have a fabulous conversation. It's recorded and I know how to save it. Okay, Cynthia? Yeah, I, I just, it's, it's not a conclusion or whatever. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, you know, my thought came to me uh, when I heard all the conversations. Um, it's, uh, I think, uh, if I heard everybody correctly, it's about hierarchy. Um, it seems to me, you know, I, I read a long time ago that the, um, some scholars had an experiment. And so they had a group of people uh, working together and over time, hierarchy just emerged. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was supposed to be a, a, an equal conversation and everything, and then hierarchy just emerged. I think, you know, it's, in, but in the end, I mean, hierarchy serves organizational purposes. You know, people look to one person uh, for decisions, right? At the same time, you know, it also uh, kind of like increases the um, the time of communication, the, the, the chain of command and everything. Um, so, you know, globally, um, across peoples, across genders, across different social dimensions, hierarchy serves certain purposes, but then to, um, to be able to innovate, to be able to, to, to cooperate and everything, sometimes um, people have to be able to talk without thinking about the accumulated status, accumulated wealth or whatever. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic process. And um, at the same time, we really have to remember, you know, just like the example of technology, the, 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 the enforcement of hierarchy sometimes is not that subtle. It's not like, you know, we're all trained intellectuals, you know, uh, with all the abilities and uh, material and everything in the world. Um, so I think that's something that, um, 
um, that has to be remembered. And uh, again, just like the case about, um, you know, the, 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 the Chinese case, um, it's not only for the benefit for the people who are silenced, it's really for the benefit of the whole society. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody, Patty, do you have something to say? Oh, Joel, the conclusion. Bring us to conclude. Um, well, maybe, I don't know if it's the conclusion. I just wanted to respond to something that Wendy said, or was asking about earlier, just, a, just a, a thought about that, which is that, um, you know, this issue of bringing people into the digital and that it almost maybe to presume that the digital is superior. I think that it's it's the opposite. I think, you know, I've covered these movements, but I've also I participated in Occupy San Francisco, uh, you know, directly in the in in the Occupy place. And I went to Standing Rock and I was there for a short period of time, but I was there enough to experience what that was like. And I was also in Tahrir Square uh when uh, in 2011 uh what when right when it was being um uh, i showed that picture in my um presentation mm -hmm. it was uh in late july and when i got there it was in early august in august 3rd august 2nd 3rd and the military had just swept out that whole area and so that it, it was no longer there and people were trying to re see about reclaiming it and it never fully got reclaimed and um but that there's something very beautiful and there's something that you can't replicate in the digital space that you can have only in the real space in mm -hmm. or in the uh, physical space which is the human connection the breaking of bread together the uh, singing of songs, the spontaneity, the movement around um, of people uh, just learning from each other, the kind of emergent. We've obviously had this wonderful discussion just here, which has been very emergent and very wonderfully dialogical, and we've learned from each other. But what I would suggest is, is that that is uh, amplified in when you have uh, real not re i want to use the word word real but non-digital spaces and so um i think that the that the digital is has it has an amplification and it also has the ability to uh for me when i use twitter for example particularly i use twitter um uh to and i have way more people who i follow on twitter than <laughs> who follow me and that's very intense you know it's not it, it, the reason why is because i'm using twitter to learn i'm using it to hear and to find those people all around the world who aren't being amplified by traditional media sources and to and to find exactly those people and to hear their voices because i know when i participate in a black lives matter demonstration or in occupy or in in uh, Standing Rock or in Tahrir Square, I'm hearing something different. I'm he there's something different that's occurring in those spaces, in those physical spaces, than is happening in Twitter. And so the Twitter sometimes gets, you know, translates that into a way that can be understood in terms of large people mm -hmm. understanding it and liking it and retweeting it, etc. But there's a reality. Uh, I sometimes say to, to people, you know, why do you go to demonstrations? You go to demonstrations to show solidarity, to show that you're part of the, this larger movement. But a lot, another reason to go to demonstrations is to hear the speakers who are saying things from the points of view locally or wherever you're at that you couldn't hear any other place. All of a sudden, these people coming out of the woodwork, so to speak, who are saying these things and giving perspectives and it goes back again to Patty's point, I, which I thought was, you know, so well said. It's it's process. It's that kind of process, that kind of inclusive process that occurs that can only occur, not only occur, but occurs in a unique way in physical spaces. And so um, uh, I think it, I think there is this possibility of creating, I think we're in uh, the, the big thought that I'll, I'll end with is there is this possibility of creating a kind of global commun inclusive community 
but that global inclusive community also runs the terrible risk of being hijacked and becoming a global authoritarian community. And it's not, it won't be a community, it'll be a global authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. And so we're in this, we're in this phase where we're globalizing and uh, that dynamic tension is occurring. And the, the most visible way that that's manifesting is Putin invading mm -hmm. Ukraine right now. And, and to have that sense that that some one person can control or Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Uh, it's, it's that, that notion that, that, that even these, these uh, disseminated spaces can be colonized in ways that could be global. And, and that's the real fear is that we could lose everything and, but we could also gain everything. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, that's, that's the tension that we're in right now. Sounds good. Uh, Wendy, any closer remark? It's almost uh, 3.30. No, no, I, I agree with Joel. Um, th there is a need for, for organic movement, movements, not only virtual activists, because mm -hmm. it's a big mistake. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Can it I is... add something real quick? Yes. <clears throat> um, and I think most of you know about this, but I just want to mention it. There are two ways that, well, three ways that you can continue to connect. One is that there is a discussion forum on the bottom of the page for the session. So we can keep the conversation going in the discussion. And, um, you know, if, if uh, you think of something else or be sure to check in because other people might watch your presentations mm -hmm. and ask questions. So you wanna visit that and see what's going on. Uh, the second thing is that there is a um, guest book on the front page of the conference. If you scroll down towards the bottom, you put your email in there, that'll leave you connected to the committee for future events and so forth to let people know about that. And then the third thing is that there, right underneath that is a link to a feedback survey that, um, you know, if you wanna wait until you've gone through more sessions in the conference, um, you can do that, but you can provide feedback, which will help future committees and help SSSP keep this going. The more interest that we show in it, the better. So uh, thanks for letting me put on my chair hat and <laughs> thank you buddy thank make those you. little announcements at the end thank you for organizing the conference i'm joseph oh well you, <laughs> you guys had a lot to do with it too thank <laughs> you very much thank you very much uh, i'm saving this thing now i'm saving the transcript and i'm going to send it to party so she knows how to do it i don't all right but take care everybody uh see you in the other conferences and other sections all right take care Right. Take Thank care. you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.